Good evening everyone, this is Adam again, and today I'm going to make you a promise. This is going to be the best darn Section 2 Unit 2 GIRX Part 2 video you've probably ever seen. Probably ever will see. So, uh, anyway, this is the second part of GI, uh, so let's get right to it. Uh, first thing we'll be talking about are going to be our antiemetics. So obviously, uh, we have several indications for our antiemetics. Um, obviously, you're going to see them most often being utilized um, for already kind of active nausea and vomiting. Um, but certainly some other cases, you might use it uh, more as pretreatment in some cases uh, versus actual um, use for active nausea and vomiting maybe in cases of things like motion sickness. Uh, certainly before you go on your cruises and things like that, you know, before people get their sea legs or oftentimes or, you know, can be pretty, pretty ill. Um, and then uh, obviously for uh, post-operative nausea and vomiting can be a big thing. This is um, even big when, when working in places like the emergency department, you know, post-sedation for getting, uh, you know, a fracture reduced and things like that. Vomiting is, is pretty common, so you'll see a lot of these medications being utilized. Um, some frequency uh, and then also another big place uh, antiemetics uh, get used and oftentimes like multiple drugs at the same time with different mechanisms you'll see uh, these agents being utilized for nausea and vomiting associated with chemotherapy now we talked a lot about um, side effects seen with chemotherapy but nausea and vomiting is probably one of the the biggest ones um, you know different agents will have different degrees of uh, emetogenicity and so you'll see things like, you know, especially cisplatins, like huge for causing nausea and vomiting. And so you'll oftentimes see, you know, two, three, four drugs at a time being utilized uh, in order to help manage that. So looking at uh, the different reasons for nausea and vomiting that can occur, there's lots of different places within uh, the body that this is managed, uh, mostly within the GI tract and then also um, in the CNS. Um, so we do have a vomiting center uh, within uh, the medulla that is going to be um, responding to lots of different things. So for instance, you, know, you have your chemoreceptor trigger zone, you know, the solitary tract that are all being kind of innervated by things like you know, the stomach. Um, you also have uh, the vestibular apparatus, so this is where like your motion sickness and whatnot will come into play um, here. Uh, <clears throat> And so we know there's lots of complex interactions going on here between different motor and neuronal pathways. Um, but one of the big things you'll see uh, here as far as the different, uh, different neurotransmitters are going to be involved here um, are going to be uh, where a lot of our drugs are going to be targeting. So you'll things, um, see things like uh, muscarinic receptors and histamine receptors are going to be kind of more positive. On, on the side of causing nausea and vomiting, whereas um, and you see here we have 5-HT3 or serotonin um, that's going to be a positive for causing nausea and vomiting. So you also see um, where a lot of our medications are going to be focusing on, on preventing the actions of some of these receptors like um, anti-muscarinics and, and um, serotonin receptor antagonists. Um, also notice here uh, that you see our D2 receptors are going to be present. Um, again, these are dopamine receptors. So this is where sometimes um, some of our uh, antipsychotic agents can have some benefits for treating nausea and vomiting. Uh, a good one for that would be prochlorperazine. Compazine is a brand name. Um, oftentimes you'll see it being utilized um, for migraines um, and, and the nausea and vomiting that comes along with that. So some of the blockade of the dopamine receptors will also help kind of blunt the effects um, of the signals coming into uh, the vomiting center. <clears throat> So first off, looking at um, antiemetic drugs, um, you, there's a couple different ones you're going to be seeing here. The most common um, uh, antimuscarinic one that you'll see um, specifically is going to be scopolamine. So again, this is a competitive inhibition where the scopolamine will come in and will sit on top of the receptor and prevent uh, acetylcholine from activating it. Um, a couple of different forms you see with uh, scopolamine, but probably the transderm scope is going to be the most common one. Um, this is the patch uh, that ends up getting applied every three days. Um, one of the big things uh, you'll see it's being used for is, is especially for motion sickness. Um, big thing to remember with this one is that just like we've talked about with transdermal preparations before, is that their onset is fairly slow because it takes time for the drug to uh, passively diffuse through the skin. You know, it's all going according to fixed law and is, is working on a concentration gradient. Um, and so it takes time to get through the skin. And so this is oftentimes going to be prescribed like prior to a person um, 
being exposed to whatever you know uh, trigger is affecting their nausea and vomiting. So you know, if I know I'm going on a cruise and I want to uh, prevent motion sickness, this would be a good time to take you know the drug, say a few days beforehand, maybe even a week beforehand, to kind of get used to a this, uh, the adverse drug reactions, um, and then also um, allow the drug to actually get into the system and get to steady state. So. Um, one of the big things here, and uh, the reason why I put this uh, kind of creepy looking picture here, um, is to make sure you really wash your hands or, or tell your patients to wash their hands uh, whenever they're handling the uh, scopolamine. Um, because it's a muscarinic receptor antagonist, if you get any on your fingers, your hands, and then you wipe your eye, um, you'll actually end up having this like kind of prolonged um, dilation of uh, of the eye. Um, so you can be looking very midriatic, maybe causing blurry vision um, due to the uh, that there. So you know sometimes you, you see people uh, unequalness and you think something like a stroke, but um, this would be one of the cases where it's all drug induced and it does go away with time. Um, obviously, the side effects of this drug are going to be very similar to. Um, any other anti-muscarinic drug we have, so again, dry mouth, blurry vision, urinary retention, all goes back to that mnemonic of uh, you know, mad as a hatter, blind as a bat, or as a bee, etc. Um, some other drugs we can utilize for as antihistamine actions, along with some uh, anti-muscarinic actions, are going to be things like diamond hydronate or dramamine, and then also promethazine or phenergan. Um, again, these are going to work very similar and very similar side effects to what you would see with um, an anti-muscarinic anti-muscarinic like scopolamine, but this will also be pretty sedating for the most part. So um, promethazine is, is very, very sedating, but it's also very potent for knocking out nausea and vomiting. And uh, this is going to be another one that actually um, falls in that category of, of the same chemical class as a lot of the uh, antipsychotics. And so um, you know, maybe some dopamine receptor blockade is also going to help um, prevent uh, nausea and vomiting from occurring there. Uh, moving on and looking at the anti-serotonergic drugs, um, so these uh, specifically are going to be blocking 5-HT3 uh, uh, receptors. Um, again, the 5-HT3 is going to be a specific subtype of uh, serotonin receptor. Um, so this is going to work uh, in not only in the CNS to block uh, the effects on the chemoreceptor trigger zone and the solitary tract, um, but it's also going to work um, in the periphery as well. So it can work you know, directly on the, the stomach and the GI tract uh, to prevent that nausea and vomiting. Um, a couple of drugs that fit into this category is going to be on Dansatron, brand name Zofran, which I'm sure everyone's uh, pretty familiar with. Um, you also have a couple other ones, uh, Dalasatron or Anzimet, and then Granisatron or Chytral. Um, again, these are very nice because they are very effective uh, for treating nausea and vomiting, especially in, in chemotherapy. And actually, um, these were kind of lifesavers for a lot of patients because um, some of the medications that chemotherapy patients were having to use uh, prior to the advent of the serotonin receptor antagonists um, were a lot of these agents that blocked the dopamine receptors. So things like uh, metoclopramide, things like promethazine, um, they had to use very, very high doses in order to help manage that nausea and vomiting. Well, as you remember from blocking the dopamine 2 receptors, you end up seeing these dystonic reactions and eventually you can have things like um, uh, extra pyramidal side effects and even tardive dyskinesias. So you'd have these chemo patients who were having you know, kind of Parkinson's-like symptoms just in order to treat their uh, nausea and vomiting. So these agents were kind of a godsend and, and are very effective without having a lot of side effects associated with them. Some things you can see, uh, though, if you did see an adverse reaction, is going to be maybe some headache or diarrhea. Um, constipation in some cases, uh, but one of the big things that you definitely want to be on the lookout for, especially if you have patients who are on multiple medications that do this, are going to be the, is the uh, QT prolongation that can occur. Um, obviously, the longer the QT prolongation uh, is, the more you're going to see a potential for uh, things like torsades. Um, so again, uh, usually not a problem when the drug's by itself, but certainly if you had a person who had, say, like a congenital prolonged QT, or if you had someone who... Um, was on multiple medications that prolong the QT, uh, QT interval, that, that, would, that would be concerning. And so you'd want to make sure to review that med profile beforehand. So then uh, to speak more specifically about the antidopaminergic drugs, um, some of the big ones we'll see here are going to include uh, metoclopramide or Reglan, um, seen pretty frequently, especially in the post-operative um, type setting. Um, and then looking at the phenothiazine specifically, again, this goes back to our um, first generation antipsychotics we kind of talked about before. Um, but again, all of these are going to block dopamine 2 receptors and are going to be pretty potent for uh, knocking out nausea and vomiting. So some of the ones you see more commonly here are going to include uh, prochlorperazine, uh, chlorpromazine, haloperidol, and flufenazine. 
Um, again, notice that we're using ones that are going to be a little bit more specific for the dopamine 2 receptor, um, things like haloperidol and flufenazine. But on the other hand, you can use kind of the, the less potent agents as well because the antimuscarinic actions, the antihistaminic actions are all going to also help with nausea and vomiting. Um, obviously, some of the adverse effects we can see are going to include dizziness, fatigue, seizures, um, sedation in a lot of cases. Um, a lot of these drugs are very, very sedating. Um, and then, obviously, all of the things that go along with blocking dopamine receptors. So, we obviously, worry about things like hyperprolactinemia um, and then also um, the potential risk for neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Which, again, doesn't happen very often, but certainly patients who are receiving very high doses of this are going to be more at risk. Um, we also have cannabinoids. Uh, we know that there's a couple different cannabinoid receptors um, within uh, the brain, uh, CB1, CB2 being uh, the most commonly talked about ones. Um, but we actually uh, know that you know uh, activation of these receptors are going to cause um, a semantiomatic action. So the medication we can use uh, until you know Florida has you know uh, medical marijuana is going to be dronabinol or marinol. Um, so this is uh, uh, basically just delta-9 THC, um, the same as you would see in actual marijuana, um, but this is an oral formulation uh, the patient can take. Um, so you see this most oftentimes used uh, for nausea and vomiting associated with chemotherapy, um, especially if they failed a lot of other agents. Um, it's going to be working centrally uh, on the vomiting center by activating the CB1 receptors. Um, and the main side effects you're going to be seeing here are going to all include things that you would expect to see um, with uh, THC exposure. So confusion, euphoria, dizziness, and hallucinations, um, some mood changes. Uh, the, one of the big things, uh, though, that's not necessarily a side effect on some patients will be the increase in appetite. Um, so a lot of these patients who are receiving these chemotherapy meds, they have a lot of issues with weight loss um, because, uh, you know, if you're sick as a dog, you're not going to really have much of an appetite. And so oftentimes this medication will also be utilized as a pro, um, uh, as an appetite uh, stimulant. Um, so again, you have uh, patients who are having issues, especially like wasting syndromes, um, cannabinoids like dronabinol can be pretty useful in helping to kind of stimulate their urge to eat and hopefully put some weight back on. Another way that we can um, inhibit the chemoreceptor trigger zone uh, in preventing um, the actions of substance P um, is going to be by blocking it with uh, drugs like Aprevitin or Emend is the brand name. Um, so this one is pretty expensive and it's mainly going to be used um, in treating the severe nausea and vomiting associated with a uh, high imidogenic uh, chemotherapy drugs, so especially things like cisplatin. Um, in some patients, you're going to end up seeing that they not only have an acute case of nausea and vomiting associated uh, directly at the time they get the drug, but also, also um, they can have a chance to have a, kind of a delayed phase reaction, um, you know, 36, 72 hours uh, after the fact. Uh, many patients end up having um, uh, some degree of nausea and vomiting in it as well. And so uh, what we end up seeing is that the 5-HT receptor antagonists, things like on Dancitron, work best against kind of these acute phase um, nausea and vomiting episodes, but really uh, substance P antagonists are going to work better for the more delayed phase. Um, so substance P uh, will be working at this NK1 um, receptor, so uh, prepotin is going to come in and block the actions there. And so you oftentimes will see a given kind of a dose pack where they'll get it with chemo on day one and then for the following two days to kind of cover them for that uh, delayed phase. Um, Biggest drug interaction to look out for here is that it is metabolized by CYP3A4, so you would have to adjust um, the doses of your other drugs uh, if they are also met uh, metabolized by CYP3A4 and will be inhibited um, by that. Moving on from the antiemetics, um, we have some prokinetic agents um, that are going to be useful for um, dealing with issues of you know slowed peristalsis or uh, things like gastroparesis or GERD. Um, and so metoclopramide is going to be another drug that's going to be um, good for doing this. Um, again, it's going to be working as a dopamine receptor uh, antagonist. Uh, <clears throat> so normally uh, activation there is going to suppress acetylcholine release, um, but by blocking the uh, presynaptic dopamine 2 receptor, you're actually going to see an increase in acetylcholine. And we know this acetylcholine is going to be able to activate muscarinic receptors on the GI tract, and that's all going to help stimulate uh, a peristalsis. Um, <clears throat> so we see um, increased gastric emptying time, I'm sorry, decreased gastric emptying time, 
um, you know, the increased upper GI motility, and then also increased uh, lower esophageal sphincter tone, which again are all going to be good things for patients with um, you know slow um, slow absorption uh, and and GERD. Um, so again, we talked about the uh, side effects here, and again, a lot of it comes back to that blockade of the dopamine two receptor. Um, so again, increased prolactin, NMS, again, all be issues um, seen with this. Another drug um, useful as a uh, pro-kinetic uh, agent is going to be cisapride or propulsid. Um, this is actually an agonist at the 5-HT4 receptor, but an antagonist at the 5-HT3 receptor. So kind of similar to how you see with things like ondansetrons blocking that 5-HT3 receptor while being active on the 5-HT4. Um, so this one uh, has lots of issues with it, and so uh, unfortunately it ended up being removed from the market due to issues with, like prolonged QT intervals. Um, especially with CYP3A4 interactions on other drugs. Um, so currently it's uh, only available on an investigational purpose, um, so it's kind of really limited access, um, but just be aware it might be something to see out there one day. Uh, and then we also have uh, erythromycin, uh, which as you guys remember is a macrolide antibiotic. Um, but the nice thing here is that it can work as a pro-motility agent um, since it works on the motilin receptor, um, in, uh, or it works on the same set, uh, receptors as motilin does, uh, in the upper GI tract and the lower esophageal sphincter. So most oftentimes you'll see it for issues of diabetic gastroparesis, uh, especially like diabetes. Um, uh, I see it most often in um, young children, especially like di diabetics and whatnot, and they have some issues with that, um, especially a lot of our GI kids um, that have issues with, um, you know, kind of um, abnormal anatomy, um, that, you know, shortcut syndrome and things like that, so they're not really clearing their food well. Um, these, I oftentimes will see erythromycin being um, prescribed for that reason. Um, Toxicity-wise, um, obviously you see a lot of GI upset with uh, most antibiotics, but this one's no exception. So you see cramps. Um, in some cases, you may actually um, have issues where you can have kind of a, um, a tolerance effect that can occur, um, where you know taking away the drug later on may actually lead to some uh, impaired motility. Um, so it would be something to um, uh, educate your patients about if they stop taking it suddenly. Uh, moving on, uh, we'll be uh, talking about laxatives. So um, most laxatives are going to work via a couple of different uh, mechanisms. Um, one can work as a direct stimulants um, to help increase motility. Uh, other ones are going to um, increase water content of the stool, so they'll kind of act as like an emollient uh, for easier passing of the stool. Um, <clears throat> And then some are going to work by decreasing colonic water uh, and sodium chloride absorption. So you end up having more uh, fluid uh, within the colon itself. So again, that's going to help to kind of stimulate uh, peristalsis there. Lots of indications for laxatives. So especially if you're, uh, you're preparing the bowel for surgery, so see a lot of clean outs of the GI tract with the laxatives. Um, in some cases there are... Um, Certain toxins or certain drug uh, poisonings, we can actually use laxatives to help kind of increase uh, elimination. Um, see in issues of postoperative stimulation, um, and then also helping to uh, minimize strain on patients with cardiovascular disease, because again, the increasing strain is going to increase vagal tone, which can be an issue uh, for some of these patients. Um, and then also the most common one is probably going to be just relief of um, temporary constipation. So again, this is one of those things where, um, you know, most of the time they're relatively safe and easy to use, um, but they can be contraindicated, um, especially if there's underlying bowel disease. This is one of those things where um, we oftentimes will tell patients not to take a lot of these things um, super regularly without seeing a provider because um, they may be covering up uh, something that could be a little bit more sinister than simple constipation. And this is a big, big, big um, cause for um, pediatric ER visits. Um, and I would certainly see quite a few enemas that are going out in the PZR just due to the fact that, you know, a lot of these kids are, um, diets may not be up to snuff or, um, you know, uh, chronically dehydrated and things like that. Um, so big business, especially for, um, you know, acute care and, and ED visits. Um, usually as far as side effects go for a lot of these agents, you're going to end up seeing acutely issues of nausea, some abdominal cramps, and of course diarrhea uh, being a potential uh, outcome there. Um, chronically though, you end up kind of seeing uh, this issue of a cathartic colon syndrome, uh, where essentially what's happening is that because we're kind of taking the role of um, 
stimulating the GI tract from the body and, and doing it ourselves. Um, you see issues where um, there can be damage to the nerve plexus over time. You have atrophy of the outer muscle layers. Um, so because of that, you have issues where you have malabsorption issues, dehydration, protein loss. Um, and we can also potentially see disruption in the intestinal flora, um, which can cause problems and lead to things like C. diff and, and things like that. So a couple of different laxative ca categories we'll talk about. Um, we'll start off with the stimulants or irritant uh, laxatives. Um, we have the bulk forming uh, laxatives. You know, this includes things like dietary fiber. Um, we'll talk about stool softeners and then osmotic agents. So the stimulants or irritants are typically going to be kind of your strongest laxatives. They're going to be directly affecting um, the GI tract to stimulate peristalsis and to increase motility, um, increasing things like water and electrolyte secretion. So these are very, very potent agents. Um, you know, kind of one of the older school agents being things like castor oil. Um, so we probably don't see all that too often, but certainly you'll see senna uh, and bisacodyl being utilized um, pretty frequently, um, especially uh, you know their over-the-counter preparations you can get um, pretty easily. Um, Obviously, some of the side effects we're going to see here is going to be abdominal cramps, diarrhea, and eventually that kind of muscle atrophy that can occur over time um, by stimulating, um, using uh, stimulaxes for a long period of time. Uh, this is one of those things where the body kind of gets tolerant uh, to the effects of laxatives over time, so uh, really try to limit stimulant use uh, as, as short a period of time as possible. Otherwise, you end up having issues where um, patients kind of, kind of rebound constipation uh, when you take the drug uh, away. Uh, moving on, then you have your bulk forming uh, laxatives. Most of these are going to be non digestible dietary fiber based products. Um, so, include things like your psyllium husk, your metamucil, uh, methyl cellulose. Um, these most of the times are going to be coming as powders or granules. Um, so, they need to be mixed with water uh, before taking. Um, otherwise, you know, if they try just taking the powder itself, they have issues where they end up accidentally inhaling it on in accident, and all kinds of bad stuff can happen. But, um, Essentially, the way these are going to be working are by increasing the bulk and the water content of the stool. So by doing that, you're just increasing um, kind of that, um, that stretch receptors that are in the colon to help to kind of push things forward. Um, by doing this, you're going to be um, increasing the volume. Parasols is going to increase as a result of that. Um, some of the issues you can run into, unfortunately, will include a lot of uh, flatulence and cramps can come along with that, and then potentially can uh, impair the absorption of certain drugs. So again, you want to be looking at those interactions prior to uh, prescribing. Then you have your stool softeners. Again, these are kind of emollients. They're going to help to uh, lubricate the stool to help uh, it pass a little bit easier. Um, so you can see things like mineral oil or glycerin. Um, you'll see that some of these will be available as either as um, oral preparations or available as either suppositories um, or enemas. Um, so certainly, I see glycerin enemas being utilized pretty frequently, especially in um, infants and, and uh, neonates um, when they're constipated, uh, simply due to the fact that it doesn't really get absorbed, doesn't cause a lot of electrolyte shifts or anything like that. Um, and then more for you know, adolescents and adults, I see a lot more docusate or colase being utilized. Uh, and then you have your uh, osmotic agents. And so these are going to be, um, a lot of these are going to be either um, electrolytes or just osmotically active particles. And so what they're going to help do is draw a lot of water content into the, the colon to help to increase motility. Um, so you can see things like magnesium sulfate or mag hydroxide, milk and magnesia. Remember, as we talked about in our um, antacid section, we talked about magnesium hydroxide causing um, diarrhea. And again, this is here where it can be used as a laxative uh, rather than an antacid. Um, some people call this one the green rocket because it usually comes in a nice uh, big green bottle. Um, and you'll be flying like a rocket to the bathroom for sure. Um, things like mannitol, lactulose can also be used for this. And then you have polyethylene glycol or Miralax. Um, it's oftentimes, um, you know, since it became over the counter, its use has um, grown pretty significantly. I see a lot, a lot of patients on this um, just uh, consistently over time just due to the fact that it helps to provide nice regular um, bowel habits and whatnot. Um, you'll also see larger bottles of polyethylene glycol being utilized in a formulation called Go Lightly. Um, this is kind of a balanced um, salt solution where um, you can utilize it prior to surgeries and things for like bowel clean outs. Uh, we also have a couple anti-diarrheal agents. Um, so these are going to help enhance water absorption uh, and they also will decrease GI motility locally. Um, 
the ones we have here are going to be uh, opioid-based. Uh, we haven't talked too much about opioids yet, but when we uh, talk about that section, we'll see that on the GI tract, there's, um, it, their influence is going to help slow um, peristalsis, uh, and so we'll see that constipation is a huge side effect from all these opioids. Um, but we also see that you can actually utilize, um, utilize them as an anti-diarrheal agent. Two big ones you're going to see are going to include uh, diphenoxylate or low modal. Um, this one is actually um, going to be in combination with atropine. Um, the idea being that uh, this drug is not really absorbed all that well from the GI tract, but if you were to uh, inject it, you would get some of the opioid effects. Um, so that's why they end up including it with atropine. So if the patients were to inject the drug, the atropine would cause them to have um, an, you know, an anti-muscarinic type toxidrome, and they would be just having a really bad time from that. So try to... Um, uh, prevent abuse from occurring with the drug. Um, then you have a loperamide, again, also working on those opioid receptors in the GI tract, again, not very well absorbed. Um, this one actually doesn't really cause a whole lot of central opioid effects because the blood-brain barrier actually prevents it from crossing. And so the um, peak glycoprotein is able to kind of uh, shunt the drug out of the CNS and, and back into the you know, central circulation. So you actually don't get any opioid effects from that. Obviously, um, the adverse effects we're going to see here um, are going to be things, issues of constipation, especially if they're taken for a long period of time or high doses, um, and even, um, potentially even like kind of like a GI megacolon kind of type situation. Bismuth subsalicylate or peptobismol is also going to be useful as an antidiarrheal agent. Um, it helps to in inhibit some intestinal secretions. Um, you'll see it oftentimes utilized for infectious diarrhea. Um, especially things like, you know, uh, E. coli or salmonella. Um, and usually it does have to be taken somewhat frequently throughout the day. Um, and just remember that uh, it does have a salicylate content to it, so you do want to uh, avoid that, especially if patients are taking other sources of aspirin. And to continue on, we'll start talking about inflammatory bowel disease and irritable bowel syndrome. So just some definitions, um, two of the big things we'll talk about with inflammatory bowel disease will include ulcerative colitis, um, which is basically just diffuse inflammation of the uh, mucosa of the colon and the rectum, and then also uh, Crohn's disease, um, which is going to be a little bit more kind of widespread, um, but essentially it's this transmural um, mucosal inflammation, um, kind of seen as like skip lesions um, that will generally uh, involve you know any part of the GI tract. Um, so looking here at the involvement, you can see, um, you know, the colon around 28%. The ileum certainly gets hit pretty um, hard. Almost half of those patients are being affected um, in that area. Uh, looking at the rates um, of uh, ulcerative colitis, you see, you know, it remains pretty consistent, even though with Crohn's disease, they're actually rates are doubling or tripling over the past uh, several decades or so. Um, so uh, we end up seeing this being uh, in a higher proportion in you know, northern countries and, and more developed nations uh, than elsewhere. And typically you have kind of like a bimodal distribution that occurs where you see the first peak um, anywhere between 15 to 40 and then usually the second one uh, later on in life between 15 and 80 years of age. Um, so we don't necessarily know the exact cause for um, uh, either ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. Um, we do certainly believe it is polygenic, um, usually with genetics playing a more close role uh, in uh, Crohn's disease. And, you know, not only that, but it's also believed to be a heavy uh, environmental component that's involved as well. Environmental-wise, um, we see that, you know, there's kind of conflicting ideas on what type of diets may be involved. Um, some people believe it could be issues with excess sanitation. Um, Looking at things like smoking, actually interesting that you see there's increased risk of Crohn's disease associated with this, whereas you have a decreased risk for ulcerative colitis. Uh, but lots of different causes where you're um, ultimately not sure what necessarily is the cause of it, but usually it's going to be, um, it's thought to believe that, you know, there's some sort of environmental trigger that occurs that sets off some people that are uh, genetically susceptible. Um, so just looking at uh, normal immunohomeostasis, we see here um, the GI tract um, kind of functioning normally, normal amount of um, uh, various uh, inflammatory mediators being formed, uh, which you end up seeing in cases of something um, where you have a malfunction where the, the body is kind of, immune system is ramped up against uh, the GI tract. You end up seeing um, a lot of issues with um, you know, degradation of the cells, a lot of um, lesions and, and ulcerations can occur um, due to this kind of overactive immune system and the, and the body kind of attacking itself. 
looking at the pathophysiology, um, you know, we know this is an inappropriate response uh, for a kind of a malfunctioning defense system to the normal GI flora and other antigens that come along within the GI tract. Um, so what you end up seeing is things like, you know, a leaky epithelial, uh, epithelial barrier, um, issues with, you know, altered antigen uh, recognition and processing, um, and basically just kind of a, just overrunning of the uh, immune system against uh, the GI tract. <clears throat> Um, looking at ulcerous colitis specifically, you see um, that usually the inflammation is going to be confined just to the rectum and the colon. And you usually end up seeing these primary lesions happening here in the crypts of Libricoon, um, along with these like, kind of pseudo polyps and, and collar button ulcers that occur. Um, on the other hand, you have Crohn's disease where the inflammation um, is kind of all the way throughout um, the epithelia, you know, including the mucosa, submucosa, and all that. Um, and it's going to be occurring throughout the GI tract. So again, terminal ileum is the most common, um, and usually the inflammation is going to be pretty discontinuous for the most part. Again, just another picture kind of showing the differences between what you know normal colon might look like versus um, kind of the changes in the malformations that happen uh, when end up having um, ulcerative colitis. And just some uh, pictures um, kind of showing you some of the, the lesions that can occur here. Here, so you kind of see, um, uh, especially with like C, uh, Crohn's disease, you see kind of the patchiness to it, um, where you have normal mucosa kind of spread about the kind of patchy areas of inflammation. Um, just looking at the common presentation and symptoms, you can see here that the common ones are going to include things like um, diarrhea, abdominal pain, weight loss, all of that. Um, additionally, you can have some more um, kind of systemic effects where you can have like fever or hypotension. Obviously, since your um, GI tract or uh, immune system is going to be ramped up, you're going to see issues uh, with increased uh, white blood cell count, also um, ESR. Again, um, as we said before, ulcerative colitis is mainly confined to the rectum of the colon, whereas uh, Crohn's disease is going to be kind of more throughout the GI tract. And here you can see some kind of uh, further uh, complications that can happen um, either within the GI tract or, or throughout the body. Um, usually you see, uh, you know, the diagnosis is going to be based more on, on symptomatology. Um, so typically there's a, a pretty characteristic presentation um, or family history and then obviously an endoscopy is going to be um, pretty useful for kind of examining the, the tissue to seeing exactly what's going on. Um, see here, you know, severity can be um, described by basically how many bowel movements you're having a day, whether or not more systemic involvement is, is present or not. Kind of the same thing here for Crohn's disease as well. Um, whereas you see here, the severity is not necessarily based on, on bowel movements, but more based on um, you know, symptomatology, uh, whether or not things are uh, reacting to steroids or not. Um, as you remember that when you have these rheumatologic cases of an overactive immune system, obviously steroids are going to be a big help here as an anti-inflammatory to kind of knock a lot of that down. So looking at therapeutic options, um, basically uh, there's a couple of different things we can use for ulcerative colitis. Um, we'll see here that topical or oral immunosalicylates uh, will be useful. Um, we'll have uh, uh, topical oral IV corticosteroids, we also have immunosuppressants, um, there's a few monoclonal antibodies you can be seeing used here, um, and then uh, things like probiotics, nutritional support, and then finally surgery uh, may be kind of a last ditch effort for some patients. Um, Crohn's disease you'll see here is mainly going to be uh, very similar in a lot of the options we're going to be picking, um, but since the disease is usually more diffuse throughout the GI tract, you'll see um, that certain options, especially like rectal options, are not going to be possible uh, with Crohn's disease. Um, and then you'll also have um, some antibiotics that will be involved in here and, and potentially some antidiarrheals. So the first category we'll talk about are going to be the aminosalicylates. Um, one option here is going to be sulfazalazine. And so this is actually a pro-drug um, that within the GI tract will be broken down into the sulfapyridine and 5 aminosalicylate. Um, this gets metabolized by the clonic bacteria itself. Um, and so as you know, uh, you know, aminosalicylate or salicylic acid is going to be um, it's going to be anti-inflammatory by inhibiting um, cyclooxygenase um, and also lipoxygenase pathways. Um, and then uh, by doing that, you're kind of knocking down a lot of the inflammation uh, locally. Um, nice thing here is you're not having a ton of absorption, so you don't necessarily see a lot of systemic effects. But some things you may see 
I can include things like diarrhea, and abdominal pain. Um, rarely we see some blood dyscrasias that can occur there as well. Mesalamine is going to be another uh, fairly common amino sulfate uh, that is uh, available. This one itself is just five amino sulfates. So instead of uh, having a prodrug, it itself is going to be active. Um, so again, this is going to be working through in inhibiting inflammation uh, via the cyclooxygenase pathway. You end up seeing fewer side effects here from the sulfasalazine, uh, mainly due to the lack of fact that you're only having the one uh, salicylate product versus having um, the other uh, component of it. Um, lots of different availabilities here. So you have some that are going to be in a delayed release tablets. You have some that are going to be um, in capsules. Um, some are going to be um, either uh, rectal enemas, like the Rowasa is an enema-based product. The Kinasa is going to be a suppository. So depending on symptomatology, um, you can get away with using uh, rectal options, which will only um, be affecting part of the GI tract versus using an oral option, which should be affecting all of the GI tract. Um, some other options can include uh, osalazine, which is actually just a dimer of mesalamine, so basically just two mesalamine molecules uh, thrown together, uh, and that again will be broken down with colonic bacteria. And then you also have uh, balsalazide, uh, which is a, a prodrug that contains a 5 amino salicylate, but it's on an inert carrier molecule, so it actually gets um, cleaved from that with the bacterial uh, metabolism. Uh, moving on, then you have corticosteroids. So there's a couple of different options here. You can use topical corticosteroids, which will be utilized either as like a suppository, a rectal foam, or a suspension enema. Um, so you can see hydrocortisone being used here most frequently. Um, this helps to limit systemic side effects um, by only administering it to the area where it's needed. Um, we certainly also have oral options as well, but again, you're going to have more systemic absorption, so more side effects to go along with that. And then for very severe um, cases, you're going to see IV being used as well. So this is when you have a severe exacerbation. You can have kind of pulse dose steroids being utilized um, to help knock down that inflammation. Um, obviously, we know there's lots of side effects associated with our corticosteroids, including things like weight gain and edema, um, issues with uh, glucose intolerance, um, osteoporosis, uh, especially in our older female patients. Um, so again, we utilize um, in the IV and oral options as a kind of pulse dose um, and try to limit systemic um, exposure as much as we can, um, but you'll see the topical ones being used uh, maybe a little bit more regularly since you don't have uh, necessarily as much absorption. <clears throat> um, so besides just using um, amino salicylates, um, we also have some options. Uh, amino salicylates are, are corticosteroids. We also have other immunosuppressants that we can utilize. Um, so uh, big options are going to be, including here, are going to be the thyropurines. And so these are going to be working very similar to what we saw in, in um, say, rheumatoid arthritis, very similar to what we saw with some of our cancer um, drugs, is that these are going to be decreasing the metabolism of the purines and actually inhibit DNA and RNA synthesis. Obviously, this will be affecting more rapidly dividing cells, so this ramped up immune system is going to be taking the biggest hit here. These are typically going to take a while to work, so um, an example of things like 6 mercaptopurine or azathioprine could take up to 3 to 6 months to really see full effect, so certainly a good counseling point for your patients. Um, obviously, adverse effects are going to include you know, flu-like symptoms, nausea, vomiting, um, but obviously uh, secondary infections due to this myosuppression uh, will also be a big risk as well. <clears throat> Other immunosuppressant agents we can utilize uh, would include something like cyclosporin, which inhibits the release of um, interleukin-2, which actually helps to uh, limit the amount of T-cell activation that occurs. Um, cyclosporin usually being seen uh, in the uh, transplant realm as an um, anti-rejection medication. Um, this one um, has uh, some unique side effects here where it can cause some nephrotoxicity. So obviously be aware if your patients already have kind of poor renal function to begin with, uh, can worsen hypertension. Um, obviously, secondary infections are going to be a risk, and then also can cause some hirsutism or unwelcome uh, hair growth in some of your patients. And then uh, methotrexate can also be used as well. Um, you see here is usually going to be given um, weekly uh, in, in um, Crohn's disease. Um, again, these are fairly low doses as compared to what we would see with, for chemotherapy uses. Um, only 25 milligrams IM versus, you know, sometimes you see grams and grams in, in uh, chemo patients. Um, Adverse effects here are going to include um, stomatitis, nausea, vomiting, and myelosuppression. Um, remember with methotrexate, we also will see hepatotoxicity uh, being possible here, uh, and then also a chance for some dermatologic reactions. 
Moving on, uh, we then have the uh, monoclonal antibodies. So there's kind of two big options that are going to be here, um, seen most often. So you have infliximab or Remicade, uh, and then you have adalimumab or Humira. And so um, both of these are going to be chimeric monoclonal antibodies, and these are targeted specifically against TNF-alpha or tumor necrosis factor alpha. Um, again, we've seen these being used before when talking about rheumatoid arthritis. Um, obviously, one of the big risks here is you worry about um, uncovering latent TB uh, due to its immunosuppressant effects. So you always want to make sure you're looking for um, you know, doing a TB test or doing a PPD before um, prescribing these medications. Um, usually, these end up having to... Um, uh, especially with like Remicade, you'll see it being infused um, at uh, we certainly weekly intervals. So say like in the induction uh, phase, you'll see you know uh, five mg per kilo IV uh, at weeks zero, two, and six. So usually they're coming into like an infusion type center um, on the, on those days that they need that. Um, and obviously the dose will kind of back off a little bit um, or less frequently at least uh, when in more of a maintenance mode. And then adalimumab or Humira. Um, this one's actually nice because it, it does come in a subcutaneous pen format, so it's able to be given kind of at home without worrying about um, uh, you coming into an infusion center and, and things like that. Looking at adverse effects for um, Humira, um, obviously you're going to see things like nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, um, but also um, we see issues where you can have some worsening CHF um, for patients who maybe already have pre existing CHF. Um, and there is some risk for secondary malignancies that can come along uh, with any of these monoclonal antibodies, so that's always, always a risk there. You can also look at probiotics. Um, so again, this is going to be things that you can find in normal yogurt and things like that. But these are going to be live, non-pathogenic bacteria, um, and we've kind of seen some uh, some conflicting results. But um, usually, these are helpful full and maintaining um, remission. Idea here being that um, by kind of getting rid of maybe some uh, altered GI flora um, that maybe your body is having that reaction to um, by restoring it with um, you know, kind of non-antigenic um, bacteria they can help to kind of restore normal GI flora and and prevent um, the UC from flaring up. Um, so lots of different varieties you can see things like Sarcomyces or um, Lactobacillus um, but again um, no clear option for which one's going to be uh, the best one. Another treatment option that you might see, especially um, for Crohn's disease, will be uh, antibiotics. Um, so again, possible benefits here is if we can get rid of some of the um, disease-causing uh, bacteria and maybe help to increase our beneficial bacteria with something like a probiotic, um, you can help to decrease things like bacterial uh, tissue invasion and hopefully um, kind of decrease some of the systemic dissemination of, of these bugs. Um, some of the risks involved with this is that it's not necessarily evidence-based. Um, there's not really any clear consensus on um, what is the best option here. And then you also worry about with chronic antibiotics on board, you're in the risk of having uh, resistant bugs uh, developing over time. Um, the, some of the common ones you'll see here include things that have um, good gram-negative coverage um, and some anaerobic coverage. So um, you'll see things like ciprofloxacin being utilized, I would say once daily, or metronidazole as well. Um, other possible agents um, could include things like tetracycline, colithromycin, or rifaximin. So as far as um, treatment goes with ulcerative colitis, the goal is to help induce remission of symptoms and the mucosal inflammation. We help to maintain that remission, help to improve this quality of life. Um, and obviously treatment is going to be pretty dependent on the severity and location of the disease. Looking at uh, this diagram here, you can see that depending on where the inflammation is going to be located to. So again, if it's basically the entire colon that's being um, affected, um, our topical agents are not really going to be all that useful, mainly because they're not going to be able to um, reach far enough in order to help uh, make contact with all, those options, with all the areas being affected. Um, if it is going to be more, um, you know, if it's, if it's just a left-sided colitis, you can get away with using a topical product, like um, some of the topical corticosteroids or the amino salicylic acid products. Um, but other hand, on the other hand, if it's going to be more diffuse, then oral um, options are going to be uh, the best thing there. And in Crohn's disease, because it is so uh, disseminated, that's going to be more oral um, options. There's really no topical products you can utilize uh, for Crohn's. 
So looking at the algorithm, um, essentially what we're going to be looking at is, um, you know, and for testing purposes, the kind of questions I might ask is say like, you know, a patient is experiencing, you know, proctitis or left-sided ulcerative colitis, you know, what might be the best option for them based on whatever clinical situation I come up with. And really the things to be looking for is like, okay, well, what's the first agent I'm going to go with? And in general, you're generally going to start with um, one of these uh, immunosalicylate products. Um, and then depending on whether you know, or not it's, you know, the full colon is being affected or not, you, know, you have to decide whether topical or oral might be good options here. But essentially, kind of what the, um, the algorithm is going to be is you would start off, um, again, with the topical aminosalicylic acid product. Um, you know, if that is useful, if that is working, just stick with that. If not, this does not control the symptoms. You want to add on a topical corticosteroid. So again, this is most often going to be something like um, our hydrocortisone, you know, rectal foams, and things like that. Um, you know, if symptoms are controlled at that point, then you want to help to taper the uh, corticosteroid as much as possible because you want to um, try and um, essentially limit the amount of systemic uh, corticosteroids you're going to be absorbing. On the no hand, if their symptoms are still happening, uh, then you can consider utilizing either oral aminosalicylates or uh, corticosteroids. If no, uh, again, you want to kind of reevaluate the situation and see where to go from there. Um, if it's yes, is controlled, then again, obviously go back to try to use your topical products. If you had more of a uh, uh, more involved left-sided ulcerative colitis, you see here that the options are. Um, mainly going to be the, uh, the same. You know, if you're worried about the left-sided colitis being uh, a little bit further past um, uh, the flexure, then you want to consider maybe using oral products as well. Um, so again, more focus here on the oral products than would be with just the topicals. As you move on down, as you know, we see that you know oral corticosteroids, if they're not really doing the job, um, this is when you want to start adding on something like an immunosuppressant, like either azaz either Ezathioprine or 6 mercaptopurine. That's still not working, then you want to move on down to looking at something like either surgery or uh, a monoclonal antibody. So something like infliximab, um, again, probably has more evidence than something like adalimumab has, has at that point. The goal that once you have symptoms controlled, then you start to kind of taper back and use kind of the lowest dose uh, of whatever product you can. Um, and again, try to get them off corticosteroids if possible. Uh, if they have extensive ulcerative colitis, um, this is where you're going to be um, using oral products. Um, sometimes you'll see uh, sometimes an oral aminosalicylic acid product on top of a, a topical one. This is, again, just to hope to get the best coverage possible. Um, you know, if uh, symptoms are not controlled, then you're going to be moving on to oral corticosteroids. Um, and then, again, similar pathway where you're looking at either adding on an immunosuppressant, or if that's not working, then try something like infliximab. Um, on the other hand, if you're having a severe exacerbation of your UC, then you want to go ahead and start with pulse dose IV steroids. So this would be like your methylprednisolone, um, hydrocortisone, and things like that. I'm generally going to give them about a week or more of therapy, seven to ten days or so. Um, and then in some cases, we even look at um, adding something like um, uh, this is where you had like a cyclosporin on board. So IV is cyclosporin is a you know a pretty potent immunosuppressant. You add that on. Um, and so essentially just kind of like doing stepwise scaling up a therapy. Because again, the higher up we get to using uh, corticosteroids and, and things like immunosuppressants, the more side effects you're going to see. So the idea is to try to limit that, to try to use as, as um, uh, the drugs with the least amount of uh, systemic side effects. Uh, for Crohn's disease, you'll see that the goals of treatment are going to be um, very, very similar. Uh, similar, um, again, maintaining remission, improving quality of life, and then the treatment, again, is going to be pretty dependent on the severity and location of the disease. So just looking at here, say we have um, uh, Crohn's disease, you know, ileitis, and, and colitis. Um, here, focus on really only utilizing um, oral products. We're not going to really be using topical because this is going to be much more uh, diffuse. Um, here, we're going to see oral uh, aminosalicylic acid products being utilized plus or minus oral antibiotics and oral corticosteroids. Um, typically, you're going to see a lot more corticosteroids being utilized, especially up front when you're having acute uh, exacerbation. You know, symptoms are being controlled. Then you start to kind of taper down off the corticosteroids and try to get away with just using um, your oral um, aminosalicylic acid products. 
that doesn't work, if you're having to say have a more severe exacerbation, this is when you add on something like an IV corticosteroid plus either azathioprine or 6 mercaptopurine. Again, if these things are not working, then you're going to keep scaling up therapy, um, and then eventually you're going to get uh, refractory. We'll go to the next slide to kind of show um, where we go from there. Um, for refractory Crohn's disease, this is where we're going to see us kind of step up our game with immunosuppressants. So moving from something like azathioprine or 6 mercaptopurine um, to looking at methotrexate. Things are not controlled by then. This is when you move on to the monoclonal antibodies like infliximab or adalimumab. Um, that's still not working. Then you have to consider things like investigational therapies or surgery, uh, depending on how um, uh, you know diffuse the disease is. Um, you know, surgery may or may not be an option here. Um, but essentially, you know, whatever we were using for induction, you want to make sure you're keeping on on therapy and help maintain that, and prevent flare-up from happening later on. Um, if a patient does have uh, Crohn's disease with a fistula, this is where antibiotics are going to be more useful here. So antibiotics will always always be included um, in cases where you have a fistula here to deal with those bacteria. Um, again, usually maintenance of remission is going to be the goal of therapy. So again, sulfasalazine, 5 aminosalicylic acid, all these things may be utilized for um, uh, ulcerative colitis. Um, usually with the Crohn's disease, though, you may see the addition of methotrexate or the antibiotics. Um, Corticosteroids really should have no role in the maintenance therapy, so they're really meant to help you get into remission, um, and then you taper off as soon as you can. Um, and then usually the therapy is going to be lifelong unless they have like a very, very mild disease, uh, which is generally not the case. Uh, moving on, um, then we have irritable bowel syndrome. Um, so again, this is going to be a chronic condition that's characterized um, by abdominal pain or discomfort that's usually associated with these altered bowel habits. Um, so they'll generally have like a change in stool frequency or consistency. Um, and interestingly enough, you know, the prevalence is, is approximately 10% more uh, with women than, than men being affected, which is actually important when we talk about some of the medications and which genders are actually going to be um, used for. Um, we don't know a ton about the causes for it, um, but certainly we know that there's some issues with inflammation that can be occurring here. Um, there could be some issues with, you know, gastrointestinal sensor, um, sensory motor dysfunction. Um, and then uh, there could be some issues with dysregulation of uh, serotonin receptors. So, like, uh, oftentimes in, in IBS patients, you'll end up seeing an increased proportion of uh, 5-HT receptors. So that'll be important when we talk about certain medications that we can utilize um, to treat IBS. Um, obviously, there are um, issues with psychological factors. So obviously, stress is going to increase it in symptoms. And then even um, there could be an issue with bacterial overgrowth where, um, you know, stasis, especially if it's IBD, uh, by IBS with constipation, um, may help to promote overgrowth of bacteria. Um, again, diagnosis, um, lots of cl uh, classifications out there. I won't focus on the um, diagnosis so much, but again, classification will be important because whether or not you're treating um, IBS with constipation or diarrhea, obviously the medications that you're going to be utilizing are going to be uh, different based on that. So our goals with therapy here are going to be to uh, either prevent or reduce symptoms, help to improve the patient's understanding of, of IBS and help improve their quality of life uh, while we're along with it. So we can try to um, use non-pharmacologic uh, therapy as much as we can. So again, educating our patients well, looking at their diet, trying to keep diaries of you know kind of what things were triggers, what thing you know when you had good days, what were you eating versus bad days. Um, and try to avoid excesses. Um, caffeine can be a trigger as well, um, and look for a certain dietary triggers. So some people it's fatty foods, other people it's raw fruits. Just depends. Um, and then also increasing fiber can help as well, um, either with constipation or diarrhea. And then obviously there's more of a stress component to it. Maybe some psychotherapy could be helpful here. Um, you know, anything from relaxation techniques to hypnotherapy have been tried previously. So looking at the type of um, IBS that we're dealing with, we'll see that the pharmacotherapy is going to change. Um, so you can see here with IBS with constipation, uh, bulk formula laxatives, osmotic laxatives um, will be um, useful here to help kind of stimulate movement uh, of the stool. Um, Lubiprostone uh, will be a new drug we'll talk about, and we'll also talk about some 5-HT for partial agonist. And then also in some cases, um, tricyclic antidepressants or SSRIs may be utilized. Um, this may be especially useful if you have patients who have more of a psychological component uh, to the IBS. 
On the other hand, for IBS with uh, diarrhea, um, bulk forming laxatives are more useful here than, um, say, an osmotic laxative. Um, you can also use you know, anti-diarrheals like loperamide um, and cholestyramine, which we talked about back when we talked about um, hyperlipidemia. And then also you can see here that looking at 5-HT3 receptor antagonists uh, may be useful here. <clears throat> we kind of have um, kind of a mix-up of the two or kind of a... Um, Undefined IBS, uh, you can see uh, probiotics being useful here. Um, again, TCAs or SSRIs, and then antispasmodics. And then for one special case, on the small intestine bacterial overgrowth, or SIBO, we have a specific drug here called Rifaxman that we'll see being used. Um, again, our bulk forming laxatives are going to include our fiber. So again, they're going to be um, uh, absorbing water to help encourage kind of normal peristalsis. Um, they can help to relieve constipation reduce uh, bloating, it may even in some cases kind of reduce diarrhea by kind of providing more bulk and, and helping to um, kind of stabilize things a little bit. Obviously here, um, most of these are going to be um, powder-based products, um, so they need to be mixed with the, and drink with a full glass of water. So it's really important to make sure you're drinking plenty of water um, when taking these in order to help um, um, aid the process of uh, the fiber. Um, especially with uh, IBS with uh, constipation, osmotic laxatives may be useful here as well. So this is where we can see things like uh, magnesium hydroxide or milk magnesia, um, polythene glycol or Miralax um, being utilized as well. Um, perhaps if you had some you know, severe acute cases uh, of constipation, things like sodium phosphate enemas, um, lactulose and sorbitol could all be used as well um, to help draw water into the colon and help to um, force the stool along. Um, another drug that's new here that we can um, talk about is going to be um, actually a derivative of prostaglandin uh, E1. And so it, this is actually interesting because it will increase the intestinal secretion uh, of water secondary to activation of these chloride channels. So it'll kind of help to draw water into the colon to help um, increase movement and, and passage of stool. So the drug that does this is going to be lubiprostone or amatiza. Um, this one um, really has minimal and very little systemic absorption, um, so very little side effects, uh, and very few drug interactions, and, and mostly nausea is going to be the most common one you'll see used here. Looking at tricyclic antidepressants, um, we know they bind to lots of different receptors. Um, perhaps some of the anti-muscarinic effects here may be useful um, for treating uh, some of the um, uh, symptoms here, but really the serotonin reuptake may help contribute as well. Um, so here you oftentimes will see like amitriptyline or amipramine being utilized uh, most often. A lot of them are going to be given uh, at bedtime though because of they're all pretty sedating for the most part. Um, so um, by giving it then, you know, the patient kind of just sleep through. Um, again, effects are going to take a while to kick in, usually three to four weeks or so. Um, TCAs probably have just a little bit more evidence behind them or a little bit more use, um, but certainly SSRIs may be an option um, in IBS with constipation. Um, next, we have a 5-HT4 partial agonist. So this is only going to partially stimulate um, the 5-HT4 serotonin receptors, and this is going to help to stimulate the peristaltic reflex. Uh, the drug we'll see used here is going to be Tegacerod or Zelnorm. Um, you'll see here this one's going to be used um, twice a day before meals for four to six weeks. And then um, if it's effective, then you can continue on with it. Um, <clears throat> what's interesting here is that it's really only used for constipation-dependent IBS in women. They actually found that the efficacy was equal to placebo in men. Um, so it's one of those uh, kind of few drugs that um, is really kind of relegated to, to females only. Um, there's been some issues uh, in post-marketing warnings about uh, ischemic colitis and serious cases of diarrhea. Um, so because of that, it's really only available under um, an investigator uh, new drug um, uh, application. So it has to be a woman with IBS uh, C with chronic constipation, and it has to be less than uh, 55 years of age and without any cardiac uh, risk factors or disease. Um, it has to really be re not responded to other um, other agents. So it's really, really restricting who you want to give it to just due to these um, uh, significant effects um, on the cardiovascular, sy um, cardiovascular system and other issues. Um, looking at anti-diarrheals, um, this will be better for IBS with uh, diarrhea, obviously. Again, we have uh, loperamide here, which is a uh, working on the um, opioid receptors. Um, you know, it doesn't get absorbed systemically, so you don't necessarily see um, 
target was gives absorbed to the CNS. So you don't see the opioid effects there, like uh, euphoria and whatnot. But this will work specifically on the GI tract. Um, <clears throat> So this one uh, may be useful for helping to decrease the bowel frequency, but it may not always be useful for relieving all the symptoms. So it's mainly uses prophylaxis, um, especially if you are you know, your patients in a case where they know they're going to be out in public and they you know might run into issues. This might be a good agent to take beforehand to kind of help limit um, the the bowel frequency. Um, there's also a cholestyramine or questran. You guys will remember this is a bile acid sequestrant. Um, this one can be utilized um, for patients who are kind of refractory to loperamide, um, and especially who have like a post uh, cholecystectomy diarrhea. So again, if they had the gallbladder removed uh, and they are producing too many bile salts here, um, this can be utilized to help kind of bind those up and deal with that um, diarrhea. Um, for IBS with diarrhea, we also have a, another new drug. Uh, it's a 5-HT3 receptor antagonist called Alocitron or Lotronex. And again, this one is also going to be limited to women with severe IBS with diarrhea. Um, again, see issues with uh, ischemic colitis, can see severe constipation and death in some case. So again, um, lots of contraindications here. So it's um, really relegated to those patients who are, those female patients who are kind of um, uh, unresponsive to all the other medications. And obviously, they have any kind of these warning signs like um, constipation develops, abdominal pain, rectal bleeding. These are all big, big, big signs that they need to come in and get evaluated and stop taking the drug. Um, again, looking at antispasmodic agents, these are going to help to decrease contraction of the GI smooth muscle, hope to decrease the uh, gastric secretion and uh, motility. Um, again, these are most of the time going to be uh, anticholinergic agents, so you see issues of dry mouth, drowsiness, confusion with it. Um, and in some cases, actually end up um, causing constipation to occur. Most of these are going to be taken more as, as needed because eventually you had this tachyphylaxis that develops, which you guys, you guys remember uh, we talked about like nitroglycerin to where um, patient eventually, you know, stops responding to the drug because due to homeostatic um, features. So even if you increase the dose, you don't necessarily get any more benefit from it. So again, it's really relegated to as needed use. Um, a couple of different drugs that fit into this category. So this is going to include um, hyoscyamine or levsin, um, dicyclamine, uh, probably uh, the two most common ones I see being used. Um, certainly these other agents here, um, uh, propanthaline, uh, glycopyrrolate. Glycopyrrolate usually you see being utilized more as like an anti um, Usually the patient's having a lot of secretions, you can utilize it to kind of dry them out a little bit. So I see it a lot for like trach patients have a lot of secretions. Um, and you have this uh, clindinium or chlorodized epoxide or Librax. Um, chlorodized epoxide is actually a, um, a benzodiazepine, um, so it actually help to kind of slow down GI motility um, through the intent, you know, kind of enhancing the effects of GABA. Uh, if you're considered uh, to have a bacterial overgrowth, um, this uh, kind of theorized to contribute to their uh, patient's IBS. Uh, one drug we can use is called uh, rifaximin. This is actually structurally related to rifampin, uh, which we talked a little bit about when we talked about endocarditis. Um, <clears throat> it's not uh, systemically absorbed, and so it's going to be of benefit because it won't really cause a lot of side effects, but it does have good broad spectrum activity. So it's really going to be uh, honing in on, on GI bugs. Um, use it uh, three times a day for 10 days. Um, and so um, really it's, it's pretty effective, but we do run into some issues where we're concerned with increased resistance over time. Um, so it might be a day when this medication will be less effective. But currently right now, this is um, the go-to drug in, in IBS for bacterial overgrowth. Um, so looking at the uh, different treatment options here, so again, if you have a diagnosis of IBS, um, again, start up education, look at non-pharmacologic therapy, uh, and then basically look at your subtype of um, IBS. So if it's, uh, you know, um, bacterial overgrowth, rifaximin is going to be your go-to drug. Uh, if it's uh, IBS constipation, again, bulk formula laxatives should be your first go-to. Then considering uh, osmotic laxatives, <clears throat> They're still not responding to that. Then something like lubiprostone could be considered, uh, and then um, stimulant laxatives, TCAs, and then you know if you have a female patient um, who's really kind of unresponsive to everything else, then tegasterol could be considered. With IBS with diarrhea, again we're going to look at bulk formula laxatives, utilizing uh, loperamide or cholestyramine, TCAs, and then alosetron for female patients again who have not uh, failed to respond to anything else. 
And then looking at IBS, uh, it's kind of untyped. Uh, we can look at things like probiotics to maybe help restore normal um, normal bacterial uh, flora. Um, TCA is going to be useful here as well. And then antispasmodics really as needed uh, for symptoms. So in summary, um, inflammatory bowel disease, we know it's a response to a lot of uh, potential environmental triggers in genetically susceptible individuals. And it's really going to be the treatment is dependent on the type uh, and on the site of inflammation and severity. Um, so really for more milder, uh, moderate cases, uh, corticosteroids should be used, especially for flare-ups. Um, but try to taper those back if you can and utilize our immunosalicylic acid uh, products. Um, really the more severe cases um, need to be managed with things like IV corticosteroids, thiopurines, or monoclonal antibodies. Um, because again, there's going to be a lot more um, side effects with these and also increased costs associated with them. Um, IBS needs to be treated according to the dominant subtype. Um, and remember, um, it's going to be consisting of non-pharmacologic therapy with education uh, and then pharmacologic therapy really targeted towards the subtype that they end up having. So if you have any questions, um, I, we can talk about it Monday. Otherwise, if anything more uh, uh, important comes up uh, in the meantime, feel free to email me. Uh, we can talk about it there. All right. Thanks so much.